Greetings, everyone. I'm Scott Rodell here at the Great River Dawa Center, and I have another episode of Chinese Swords and Swordsmanship for you. In this episode, we're going to be looking at this very unusual Taiping Tianguo Oxtail, or New Wei Dao. The New Wei Dao is really uh, probably the best known of the type of Chinese savers, which is kind of ironic because it is the most recent type that developed and it was never a pattern military weapon. So while it's very commonly used today, most Chinese martial artists tend to favor it, and that's the type that they know, it was not the type that was in use for a very long time, and it was not the most widespread of the types of Chinese sabers of Chinese Dao because it wasn't a pattern military weapon. Of course, the, the name comes from the shape of the Dao. You can see this is a more common type, more type we're most, most used to, the type you're gonna see more widely, is this kind of shape where it widens. There's a market widening toward the tip and it has that nice belly, that nice curve, which of course is the shape of an oxtail. It's where the name comes from. But again, we have to keep in mind that whereas that would be the most, quote, typical shape that we're going to see, there is no standard. This was a type of sword that was made in a wide variety of places in different styles. So you can find them that are fairly narrow here at the base and widen a great deal, or you can find examples like this where that market widening toward the tip is rather slight. There's always a question as to why these developed, you know, how these developed. If this, say for example, this willow leaf type Dao was far more common and was the standard military sword, the sword that would have been favored by the more experienced martial artists, why did these oxtail down develop? Well, if we take a look at when they first appeared in the time period which they became more and more common, seemed to become a more favored weapon of martial artists, especially those new to uh, martial arts, those who were really needing to use a sword in the short term, I think we can answer that question. These Dao really first appear in the 19th century. Might have appeared in the very early 19th century, but they were small in numbers at the beginning of the 19th century. They grew in popularity and we grew in numbers. We know this because having examined a large number of Chinese Dao and looking at the coloration of the Tang and seeing the periods during which they were made, that they grow in popularity and a percentage of swords that being made as the 19th century progresses. So we take a look at what was going on during the 19th century. That'll give us a clue as to why these swords became more popular. And that is quite simply that there was one rebellion after another. Uh, the best known of those rebellions is the sword that this comes from, is the Taiping Rebellion from 1850 to 1860, but that was just one of many rebellions, some small, some larger, but as the Qing Dynasty weakened, as there were foreign incursions into China, more and more people, commoners, regular people who just needed to defend themselves, turned to the sword. There was, of course, many more martial arts societies, many more Buddhist and Taoist societies, some of many of which were politically oriented, that were training militia men, so to speak. There were also, of course, the local peasant militias, local town militias that needed to train to defend themselves from that. There was large scale banditry. It was difficult and dangerous to travel between cities. So what do we have? Lots of new people coming into martial arts, relatively young swordsmen who have to learn how to fight now, today, because they really can expect to have to use their weapon to defend their village, to defend themselves, their, their goods, maybe as they're traveling back and forth from, say, their village to the market. So what we have is a sword that, unlike a willow leaf, which can change direction, is a sword, I would say, of more of a, of a skilled martial artist because it has better control. I can give a more accurate cut with a weapon that's a little bit lighter. In this case, it's not even particularly long compared to a sword that is longer and heavier. So if you think about the situation, if you're a martial artist who has a lot of experience but expects to have to use your sword to defend yourself, really to fight for your life, but you're not really good at giving that perfect, right on, spot on cut, right to the neck or right to the arm for a perfect disabling cut, 
If you can't hit with that kind of precision every time, then you want to hit really hard. And that's what these Dow do. They're longer, heavier, and with that market widening at the tip, that makes it a little more of, like, of an axe-like blow. So if I'm not sure where I'm going to hit, let me hit them really hard. So sometimes people tend to look at these sorts as being a little unsophisticated kind of sort. I wouldn't say that's necessarily the case. It's just favoring more power over a maybe a little more precise kind of cut. Uh, this particular example, you can see also it has a kind of, it's flat here right at the tip. It's not sharp in there at all. And so sometimes this variant is called an ox ear because of the shape of the tip versus the ox tail. I think that's a, a minor distinction. Sometimes some collectors like to refer to that as a, you know, as an ox ear. And okay, that's fine. You can call it that, but it's not really different in the way it is balanced in the way it plays, the way it moves. The other thing you want to pay attention to, of course, with these oxtails, because of this deep curve, the belly there, you really can't give a very effective thrust with it. You'd have to bring the tip down too much. That's too hard on the wrist. It's going to come back. But of course, sabers are not really a thrust-oriented weapon. Some, you can, yes, give thrust. I can't thrust up with it, come up into the throat with it, but you can't really give a straight thrust the way you typically would with a, with a gem. I can, however, give a very effective downward poke this way. And that's important because much of the battlefield fighting was done with a shield, with a tongue pie. And if I have my shield here, that's protecting most of my body. You can't even get in with cuts. That's why you have the shield. But I can get over the top to poke into the Dui Fong's face, maybe into the throat or neck if I get in further in, maybe even hook around sometimes, maybe sneak, sneak in from the side. So that tip, and either type, definitely is set up to be able to poke downward, although you can't give a solid thrust. This example, this, this is a, a fairly long example, fairly heavy one. It's 77 centimeters, which is 30 and a half inches long. So that's, that's a, on the long side. Most typical, Military Dao at the time, the, the willow leaf and goose quill types that the military carried, they were more typically 28 inches. So again, that extra long blade, it's giving me, I'm a less confident martial artist, I might want to have a little more reach. So this longer blade is giving me that. Also, so, and, and overall that's 96 centimeters, it's 37 and, and a half inches long. So it's a big, long, heavy sword. Has also this really big pommel, sort of horse hoof shaped pommel. On the end, nice iron one, so if you're in close, you can strike with that. That helps to counterbalance it some, but it's still really very, what we call very tip heavy. Uh, and it has, of course, also this iron guard. Now, just want to touch on that for a moment. This flanged guard looks kind of like a, like a pie plate here. It's not round shaped, it's more of that teardrop oval shape, but this flanged guard, I've heard a variety of uh, let's say, interesting explanations as to what that's for, including catching blood that's running down your blade. I'm sorry, that's nonsense. If your blade is swinging and cutting and you're moving with your blade, there's no blood running down. It's being sprayed off. And what are you supposed to do? The blood runs down, you catch it there. And what do you do? Take it someplace and dump it? Obviously not. In a sword fight, you're not going to be worried about that. Very simply, what that allows is a thinner piece of metal, whether it's brass or in this case iron, to be used, it reinforces the guard and makes it strong. That's the only reason for this flange. This one's a little unusual in that it, it's bent outward, angled outward instead of parallel with the blade, but that's not so uncommon. Um, the other thing about this sword is it's really quite heavy. This is a 1,024 grams. That's a two and a quarter pounds, so again, thinking of that situation where, okay, you're a martial artist, relatively new to this, and you're absolutely thinking as a Taiping rebel, somebody fighting the government, that you're gonna be out there fighting, boom, somebody wearing minimal armor, that period they wear lots of armor, maybe some padding, definitely dealing with the shield, having to deflect and come in and hit. You're gonna to wanna to feel, yeah, I wanna have a weapon that's very solid, very heavy, so I can really hit with power as I'm moving. So 
A little longer than typical military swords of the period, definitely heavy at two and a quarter pounds, uh, 1,024 grams. That's really quite heavy, especially at this kind of length. You're gonna find dower typically about two pounds, which doesn't sound so much lighter, but again, they're gonna be more this kind of length. You take a quick comparison, that willow leaf sword, which is probably from about the same period, that's a late chain example, is 26 inches, just over 26 inches. This one is uh, 30 and a, and a half inches long. So you can see it's, it's quite a bit longer. Uh, and so at two and a quarter pounds versus say a two pound blade that's 28 inches, it's really a big difference on the arm. I can really feel it as I'm moving with this sword. I really can feel the pull but also feel that, yeah, if I couldn't be sure where I'm hitting him, I'm hitting him really hard with this style. Now, the other thing I think is very interesting about this particular one, because oxtails are fairly common. You can, you can find them on the market today. Uh, you know, they're, they're less expensive. If you're looking for an antique sword because the oxtails are a little more common and, and generally have more utilitary fittings. They're a little, usually a little bit less expensive on the market than other antique Chinese swords. Not always, but generally speaking. But what makes this one interesting is that we can date it. It's very difficult to date these or to say it's connected with this movement or that movement. Remember, those people fighting, they, whether they were on the rebel side or the government side or on nobody's side, just trying to protect their village, they're all using the same kind of sword. So you can't say, take an ox tail like that and say, oh, this was used by such and such a group. There's no way to tell that unless there is some markings, which there usually aren't. This one, though, does. Here on this side, it just has a, a sort of V decoration back and forth. It almost looks like a, kind of like a woven fabric. This one here on this side has the same thing down here, but it also says here, Tian Xia Taiping. That's very interesting because this is from the time of the Taiping Rebellion, from 1850 to 1864. I'll have a book recommendation if you're really interested in learning more about the Taiping Tiangua, the Taiping Rebellion. I'll have a, a book recommendation for you at the end of this video. Uh, that was a very interesting, but also horrible period of Chinese history when a rebel group where the rebel uh, emperor, man who became emperor of their country of the Taiping Tiangua, uh, Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, literally believed he was Christ's younger brother. So it was a situation where you had a, a, essentially a cult leader almost take over China, came very close to toppling the Qing dynasty and did establish for a time his kingdom with Nanjing as the capital. And so this sword was without question, because we got this here, it's very, it's very, it's a little bit sloppy calligraphy, honestly. The second character, Xia, looks like it could also be Zi, but it's Taiping, uh, excuse me, Tian Xia, under heaven, Taiping, Taiping, which means a peaceful, smooth kind of idea. So this was a sword that was carried by one of the Taiping rebels, which makes a lot of sense everything that we were talking about, about the way these swords were wielded and what's their strengths, what's their attributes. Uh, one of the things that's also, I think, really quite interesting about this, and it is true about oxtails in general, is that the Taiping, being a, a new country, a new, potentially new dynasty, a failed dynasty, but might have been a new dynasty, didn't have any time to create its own set of imperial regulations. Right? During the Qing period, during every dynasty, there are imperial regulations and regulate and create patterns for all the robes, the armor, the weaponry. And so this particular one is a sword that would have just been made locally by a, by a, by a swordsmith. It's a fine sword. It's a well-made steel in this kind of condition, unpolished condition. You can't really see on camera, but in close with naked eye, I can see the, the hardened edge, the inserted hard edge, I can see the patterning because of the delicate nature of this etching. I'm never going to have this sword properly polished because that would probably damage that, but I can see hints of that. But you see the sort of fullering that it has, the way it cuts in here for a little bit of a false edge here, and that in this general shape, this is rather unique, not, a, not the more sort of, quote, standard, but not, not patterned 
standard oxtail that we see here. So it's, so it's a very interesting piece in a number of ways. One, we know this was carried by one of the rebels, by, a, by one of the minorities, one of the people who were fighting against the, the Qing dynasty to overthrow the Manchus as a rebel member, a soldier in the Taiping Tianguo army. Uh, it's an unusual shape. It's not a very common sort of shape. There's little, little features. If you see more of these oxtails, now this has the intermittent fuller as opposed to a continuous kind of fuller. And so overall, it's a rather unique, really rather rare sword. A little different take on the oxtail saber specifically used by a typing rebel. And if you're really interested in learning more about this very curious time in Chinese history, I really suggest have a look at and really thorough read of Jonathan Spence's book, God's Chinese Son, The Typing Heavenly Kingdom of Hong Xiuquan. Really good book. I quite enjoyed it. I think you'll find it really interesting if you want to learn more about Chinese history. So there you have it, a really rare, unusual oxtail dao. As always, we really appreciate any of those thumbs up, your subscriptions, and please leave us a comment. Tell us what else you want to see. If you have any other things that are questions about this DAO or any others, please put them in the comments and I'll be happy to answer them for you. Until next time, thanks and 再见!